As a child, no more than a month old, I became afflicted with a full body rash that was diagnosed as a bacterial infection called impetigo. Given its contagious nature, I was to remain in the hospital for some time in order to undergo treatment, from what I've read, antibiotics being a common remedy to this. Later in childhood, I faced ailments such as chronic bronchitis, as well as colds that would seem to stay for months. And as if my immune system wasn't compromised enough, especially when considering my consumption of a standard American diet, or a SAD diet for short, consisting predominantly of processed foods containing refined carbohydrates and sugar, I spent quite a lot of time partying and drinking from my teen years onward. In retrospect, it's very possible, and in some cases downright obvious, the bad choices I had made with regard to my health, though this is only possible due to my reading books by functional medicine doctors much later in life. It really does come down to the saying that, you don't know what you don't know, and I really didn't know much of anything as a lot of health information is simply not intuitive and in many cases counter to it, especially when observing advertising for products such as food and the conventional quote-unquote wisdom that makes us feel safe in eating it. Despite the short-term measures I've taken throughout my life in attempts to preserve my health at the time, mainly out of ignorance, such as multiple courses of antibiotics over the years which tend to be passed out by doctors like candy, for the past four years, I have not been sick, and so I'll share some information I've acquired over the years that may be able to aid you in improving your health or at least provide a new perspective. As a caveat, however, yes, some of this information you will be rather reluctant to implement, or if at all, but at least you'll be cognizant that these variables may be having some form of adverse effect on your health. The first one is rather simple and is to take time out of your day for concentrated breathing. Email apnea is a term used to describe an ostensibly common phenomenon wherein people's breathing may come to a stop or become shallow unconsciously while reading emails. The next time you're reading an email, keep this in mind and prioritize your breathing. Our second factor is regarding any supplements you may be taking. Supplements can be beneficial, however, taking them in liquid form may be more beneficial as they are less prone to having additives that are irritating to the lining of the stomach. Moreover, taking this with fulvic acid can aid in the absorption process, as well as the chelation or removal of heavy metals. Third, and this one I found to be very important, is to keep in mind that the largest organ you possess is your skin. People are at least a bit careful about what they put in their mouth, and this is a good thing. However, what you put on your skin should also be taken into consideration, and potentially even more so. When you eat, at least there are filtering systems such as the liver in place to hinder toxins from getting to the bloodstream. When it comes to what you put on your skin, when I read about this subject, a figure of approximately 26 seconds is stated for how long it takes a substance to go through the skin, later reaching the bloodstream. Due to this, it is very important to familiarize yourself with the ingredients of any personal care products you're utilizing, deodorant being one to keep in mind as it's a known carrier of heavy metals. Fourth on our list, and continuing the recurring theme of heavy metal exposure, is to potentially get any amalgam or metal dental fillings removed. There's a YouTube video I've left in the reference comment displaying a tooth with an amalgam filling that has had friction applied to it. Friction, in the case of chewing, as well as heat from hot food or drink, can cause these to emit mercury fumes, and as such, it is imperative that the extraction and replacement method for these implement tools to prevent the acute exposure of mercury to all parties involved. Mercury, like other heavy metals, have affinities for certain parts of the body, such as the kidneys and the brain, where they can wreak havoc. Research has also shown that children exposed to heavy metals such as lead face a decline in IQ, and in the case of mercury, insomnia. Due to this, if you are able to, it may be a good idea to get yourself checked for heavy metal exposure. We all have some in our bodies, but of course to varying degrees, so if you perceive this to be a significant factor pulling down your health, then chelation therapy as well as supplementing with alpha lipoic acid may be worth looking into. Coming in at 5, and admittedly a bit easier said than done given its ubiquity, is to avoid the utilization of plastics as much as possible and opting for alternatives such as glass. This is due to the negative effects of BPA or bisphenol A which can be found not only in plastic items, but also as a lining for cans, on receipts, 
and even in items labeled BPA free. In the case of supposed BPA free items, they may not contain bisphenol A, but they will contain an alternative form, such as bisphenol S, which can be even worse for your health given their potent estrogenic nature. Even more so, you'll want to avoid combining heat with plastic as it directly facilitates the leaching of toxic chemicals from the plastic into your food and drinks. Microwaves are not only conducive to this, but also alter or destroy the nutrient content of your food as well. Number six is going to be obtaining a water filter, such as one that attaches to your kitchen sink. This is one I definitely did not pay attention to in the past, and which I had known about earlier. What's in your tap water? Well, anywhere from heavy metals to chlorine, and synthetic estrogen compounds originating from women's oral contraceptives. I believe it goes without saying that you do not want these in your body. Moving on to number seven, we'll be obtaining a shower filter such as a KDF one. As stated regarding the absorptive capabilities of the skin, filtering your shower water is another factor to take into consideration as to not only mitigate any toxins going through your skin and into the bloodstream, but also to prevent the inhalation of chlorine films off-gassing during a hot shower. At number eight, we have obtaining an air purifier for whichever room in your house you spend the most time in. If you do decide to buy one, take a look at the toxins they filter and see which would work best for your environment. For instance, someone who lives in an environment more prone to, say, mold spores, may want to invest in one with functions focused specifically on preventing their proliferation. Checking your home for mold may also prove beneficial as, although sensitivities to the substance vary with some individuals not showing any symptoms at all, it does not mean that it is not taking a toll on your body. Continuing with symptoms, I'll note here for number nine that just because you don't have symptoms does not mean that your body is not under attack and facing some form of chronic inflammation. Dr. Tom O'Brien talks about how a chain will break at its weakest link and that this is where you will most likely be experiencing damage and in some cases, symptoms. Of course, we all vary. So for some people, their symptoms may manifest in their skin while another person may experience a problem with their brain. Number 10, is avoiding the use of antibiotics unless you completely require them. It has become increasingly common over the years that doctors prescribe these for anything and everything, and there are consequences for this. One being resistant strains of superbacteria, due in part to patients feeling better and not finishing the prescribed dose resulting in the continued proliferation of said bacteria. Interestingly, some bacteria will reproduce with each other, resulting in the sharing of their antibiotic resistance. Not only this, but antibiotics wipe out the positive bacteria of your gut microbiome or the mass of bacteria that exists in your stomach. By doing this, you may have destroyed the bacteria causing your infection, but you've also put yourself into a state of intestinal dysbiosis or dysregulation of bacteria, thus destroying the natural checks and balances system for any pathogens that can cause damage, as well as setting the stage for conditions such as anxiety. When this happens, fungus such as Candida albicans, the white substance you may notice on your tongue following a high sugar meal, are given free reign of your body to proliferate as antibiotics have destroyed the bacteria that tend to keep it in check. In the past, probiotics were given along with antibiotics. However, this practice seems to have been abandoned and is a contributor to our common immunocompromised state. 11 is the removal or at least mitigation of the consumption of items containing refined sugar, as this is inflammatory to the body. This was personally a bit more of a difficult task for myself, and although sugar is quite addictive, removing it is definitely possible and will also hinder the proliferation of candida albicans. We must also take into consideration that sugar, when coming from a natural source such as raw honey, has enzymes aiding in its digestion. However, when ingesting high amounts of refined sugar, lacking these substances, the body utilizes its vitamin stores in order to metabolize it, which over time may result in deficiencies amongst other things. Second to last, 12 is lessening alcohol consumption, as this can play a role in altering the microbiome along with being conducive to a plethora of other complications such as micronutrient deficiencies and alcoholic fatty liver disease. And lastly, number 13 is gluten something that has been brought up for quite some time and viewed as more of a fat than anything else. Why this topic is significant is because it has been found that one form of gluten 
alpha-gliadin found in grains such as wheat cannot be digested by anyone and leads to intestinal permeability. This can heal, but for many people they hit a point that it doesn't, which leads to something termed molecular mimicry and autoimmune disease. How this works is you'll eat something containing gluten, which brings about the ability for macromolecules or undigested food particles to pass through the tight junctions of the stomach and into the bloodstream. When this happens, the body begins to generate antibodies to these macromolecules as it views them as an invader, resulting in factors such as food allergies and chronic inflammation. In the case of alpha-gliadin passing into the bloodstream, on a molecular level, it is similar to that of the cells of the thyroid. Due to this, the antibodies originally generated to attack the gliadin cells in the bloodstream resort to attacking the thyroid as well. This is what is referred to as molecular mimicry. And in the event this goes on long enough, your body may resort to automatically generating antibodies to the thyroid. And this is where we would say someone has an autoimmune disease. To make matters worse, these antibodies can stick around anywhere from two to six months following an exposure. This wouldn't be so much of a problem except sources of gliadin are everywhere, heightening the chances of cross-contamination and are literally addictive, so much so that some individuals experience withdrawal symptoms such as nausea following the cessation of gluten intake due in part to something termed gluteomorphin. Gluteomorphin possesses the ability to affect the opiate receptors in the brain as well as in the gut, the result being a cycle of hormones such as endorphins which make you feel good. These factors amalgamate into the common post hoc rationalization that they are in need of this particular food. Now, I'm very aware that this can be a lot to take in, and especially given how much people's lives revolve around some of the items explained. The purpose of this video is not to tell anyone what to do, but to provide a new perspective so in the event you are dealing with some form of health condition, or know someone that is, you at least are aware of some potential variables that may be playing a role. Like I stated in the previous video, feel free to email me and I will attempt to at least provide you with some helpful information. If you got something out of this content, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Consider donating or becoming a patron. And as always, here's to the research and take care.